Thank you, everyone, for the warm welcome. Now, I work in the ocean, and the ocean is an alien world to us. We sit on the shoreline or sit on the boat, and we only get brief glimpses of what's really happening. So in my work, I use and develop sonars that allow us to see beneath the surface of the waves to explore the ocean using pulses of sound. When we do that, we find that there's not a whole lot of food in the ocean on average. Even the coastal ocean, which we think of as a really rich habitat, contains an extremely small fraction of, of that as really food. So let me put that in terms that you might understand a little better. In the volume of this entire theater, there would be one jumbo movie theater popcorn worth of food available to be eaten. Of course, it wouldn't be neatly collected in this bucket. Instead, you'd have to swim through the entire theater to pick off individual kernels of popcorn, or maybe if you were lucky, you might get a few clumps. An additional challenge is that the popcorn wouldn't be sitting there waiting for you to eat it, of course. It would try to be, avoid becoming your dinner. And so this is the environment in which animals have to make their living. So I want to introduce you to some animals in the northernmost part of the Pacific Ocean, the Bering Sea, where we've been working on one of the most important prey species there, krill. These half-inch long uh, animals are about the heavily buttered popcorn kernel equivalent in calories for these animals, but are food for everything from whales, which take them in huge mouthfuls, to seabirds and seals that have to pick these off one kernel of popcorn at a time. We went into this with an understanding of how we thought the world worked. And we did exactly what people have been doing there for quite a long time, and mapped how many prey were in the ocean, how many krill. And that's what you see here. The red colors represent lots of krill, and the purple, essentially none. Now, what you see is that around those northern two colonies where these animals are breeding, the two white circles, it looks like a pretty fantastic place to be. But the populations of predators on these islands are declining despite decades of protection, while at the southernmost island at the bottom of the screen, that little white dot, those populations are doing great while it looks like there's nothing to eat. So we had a dilemma. Our way of understanding the world did not explain our observations. And so we started thinking about this a little differently and created a different map of this habitat. And instead of asking how many krill, this map says how closely together are they? How densely packed are they? How many aggregations are they? And this gives you an extremely different picture of the habitat. And when we combine this with other things like how deep were those prey, it starts to explain our population observations. At a smaller scale, however, we can ask the animals what's important to them about their prey by putting tracking tags on individuals and looking at their behavior, looking at the distributions of these animals at sea. And what they tell us is the abundance of prey doesn't matter. The way we've always looked at things isn't right for them. They see the world differently. It is really about how aggregated the prey are that determine their success. So patches, these aggregations, are critical to how these animals are able to make a living. In addition, we're now learning that aggregations can shape entire ecosystems. I'll take you to a little bit of a warmer climb here for some work we did over the slopes of the Hawaiian Islands, where the physics and nutrients, so the fertilizer in the ocean, sometimes sets up these really dense layers in the phytoplankton, the small floating plants in the ocean. And when that happens, the predators of these small plants aggregate just beneath them and form dense layers themselves, which in turn affects the behavior and distribution of their predators, these small two or three inch long fish, shrimp, and squid. And ultimately, that has impacts on how spinner dolphins use the habitat and what behaviors we observe in them. So these aggregations that set up in the plants affect what's happening three steps away in the food chain. And we can actually make some pretty strong predictions about what we see in the dolphins just by measuring the plant life, which turns out to be about the easiest problem in oceanography. Of course, any time we work in the ocean, or with animals in general, they have something left to teach us. And we've learned that spinner dolphins don't just interact with the prey as they find it. They instead find the densest patch that they can, and then they work together to make it better. And that's what you're going to see in this visualization. We have a group of about 20 dolphins that are basically um, uh, bulldozing prey forward so that it accumulates on itself. And once that patch that they've worked together to aggregate has become sufficiently dense, they start circling around it to maintain that patch for about five minutes. Then you'll begin to see individual pairs of dolphins break off from the circle, move into it to forage before moving back to help maintain the patch for the rest of the dolphins in the group. And so not only can prey affect predators, but the predators can affect the shape of what we see in the prey field. So we started to ask 
about by asking this question, how do animals go about making a living in what seems like an incredibly challenging environment? And they've helped us to see that aggregations are really critical. They've given us a whole new way of seeing their world. When we look more deeply at the ocean, we are given new insights on how we interact with that ocean and what we can do to effectively protect it. Thank you. Fantastic. You're terrific.